The Agenda in the Summer with Nam Kiwanuka is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism. The loss of even one child is one too many. I'm Nam Kiwanuka. As we continue to revisit powerful stories from past seasons, tonight we listen again to our conversation with journalist Tonya Talega from her 2018 Massey Lectures, grappling with the deeper story of the crisis of youth suicide in Indigenous communities. Tanya Talega speaks truth to power. She's an author, storyteller, podcast host, and most recently documentary filmmaker. Her film, Spirit to Soar, premiered at the 2021 Hot Dogs Festival and won the Audience Award in its category. As you consider her words, it is worth remembering that 4.5% of Canada's adult population is Indigenous, and of Canada's youth population, 8.8% are Indigenous. 43% of youth admissions to correctional services in Canada are Indigenous youth. Suicide rates for Inui youth are among the highest in the world at 11 times the national average. This conversation originally aired in 2018. I do want to know why you decided to focus on Indigenous youth suicide for your Massey lectures though. Let's start there. Well, it's a bit of a long story. Um, but I can tell you that it's something that's been in the back of my mind for quite a long period of time. I've wanted to go more in depth with the topic of suicide in our communities because of the crisis and because I was seeing it over and over and over again. And I think that people get lost in the headlines. You know, they see again, you know, three more girls have died in a northern Saskatchewan community. And I think that after a time, people just become paralyzed and they don't really understand what's happening, why it keeps happening. And I knew there were deeper reasons why. And it needed to be explored in a, in a longer way, in a more in-depth way than I could, again, in just newspaper articles. It was something that was a lot more substantive. And to be quite honest with you, this has been with me for a long period since I was in Moussigny about seven, eight years ago now. I was there to cover the suicide crisis in that community along the James Bay Coast. And it was there that I met a woman named Nellie Trapper. And Nellie Trapper is an amazing, amazing woman. And she was leading the youth suicide team, a crisis response team. She was helping them out, responding to kids um, at Peikateno, the uh, Indigenous Youth Children's Services that is in Musini. And it was her hard work and her dedication every day that is quite amazing. But what is also so incredibly amazing and incredibly tragic is she went home one day to find her teenage son mm. hanging in his room. Mm. I spoke to her after he, he passed and her story constantly stuck with me. Somebody who gave so much of herself to help couldn't help her own son. There was so much more to me to this story that I could ever get out in a in just a newspaper article, I knew I had to go back and do something different. So just take a moment here and remind people about what the Massey Lecture Series does. It's, this is not you on stage in one place on one night and that's it. Right? That's right. There's so much more to it. That's right, yeah. So I was asked to be the Massey Lecture and actually had a little bit of a compressed period of time. I, when the, the CBC asked me, I thought it was like, oh, you mean for next year? Because I know people spend a lot of time working on these lectures. And they're like, actually, no, we're hoping that you can combine what you're doing with for this year with the Atkinson Fellowship in Public Policy, because I've been on a fellowship for the last year. And the Massey Lecture series, first off, you have to write a book. You have to write the lectures, otherwise mm -hmm. you don't have anything to present while you're going across Canada. And it's a five-city uh, five tour across the country. Mm -hmm and you go and you present your lectures. Normally, that's how it's happened. People are a Massey, who, the people who are Massey lecturers, they go and they present at a lectern and they give a speech. When I said to the CBC, I will do this, I also told them that I'm not gonna do it as everyone else has done it in the past because that's really not me and that's not who I am. 
it's not my community. If I'm doing this, I'm going to do this in an Indigenous way. I'm going to do this um, with everyone with me. I wanted music. Um, I wanted every nation represented that we were in, every city we were in across Canada. I wanted them there. I wanted art. I wanted this to be storytelling. I wanted this to be almost ceremony because I wanted elders from every nation that we were also, each city we were in, to open the lectures. And my elder came with me as well, and he actually closed each of the lectures. So it was a very different experience, I think, for anyone who attended the Massey lectures, or even if you're listening to them on the radio. Mm. It's, again, it's, it's something quite different. And in Ontario, you did them in Thunder Bay? That's right. That's right, I did, and Toronto. Toronto. And Toronto. Yeah. And um, how Thunder Bay came about is uh, the Massey Lectures have never been in Thunder Bay before, but when, again, when they asked me to be the lecturer, I said to them, okay, I'll do this, but, but we are going to start in Thunder Bay. Mm -hmm. And they were like, oh, all right. And then actually it was Anishinaabe Aski Nation and Fort William First Nation that came together and sort of threw open the doors to the biggest hall in Thunder Bay and made it a free event for everyone to come. And it was quite an incredible evening. I'm sure. Let's tell some of these, I'm afraid, rather harrowing stories that you do tell in the book and through the course of your lectures. And I want to start with, uh, this is even hard to talk about, a youth suicide pact. Mm -hmm. um, well, all right, but rather than me fill in some of the background, why don't you just tell the story? Mm -hmm. This is a story of, um, or it, it is what has happened to seven girls seven young girls, age 12, 13, 14, who died by suicide over the last couple of years. This happened in two communities. The girls are from two communities in particular, Wapakika First Nation and Poplar Hill First Nation. Both of those communities are about 600 kilometers northwest of Thunder Bay. They are fly-in communities. Um, so that means they're very difficult to access. They're smaller communities too. Both of them don't have doctors. They don't have um, a, a large mental health staff in the communities. They don't have high schools in their communities. They're fly in, fly out if you want to access all of these services. The seven girls all met, at a, a, they were friends. They knew each other. Most of them met actually when they were in the south where they were in the Ottawa area receiving care because they were all in crisis. It was at some point they kept in contact through social media that they devised this pact. All the girls were in various levels of trauma, as you can imagine. I mean, that's why you would do something like that. And it was the leaders of Wapakika First Nation that first noticed what was happening, and they actually discovered the pact before some of the girls died. They reached out to the federal government because, as you know, the federal government is in charge of health care spending dollars for all First Nations communities. They asked the federal government for emergency health care funding for $386,000 in order to pay for four mental health workers that could come to the community straight away to help them dealing with the crisis because they had found a pact. And sadly, the Health Canada refused the request, the urgent request. Because? They said it was an awkward time in the budgetary cycle. As a result of that, cascading failures, two girls died. And then more girls died. It was, it continues to be something that is just absolutely horrific in those communities. I mean, when you're talking to about a community of 300, 400, 500, 600 people, the loss of one child mm. is remarkable. Everybody feels it, everybody knows. And it wasn't just also too that the girls were in crisis. When they died, all of the other youth in the community also went into crisis and they had to be monitored right away. And what Canada has done constantly is fly in people. Instead of having something permanent there that is in the community so the girls can be treated with their families in the community, people fly in and fly out. And that's the, that's the nut of it. They fly out, they fly in and then they leave. This is not what First Nations communities need. And First Nations communities know what they need. And they need to be in control of their own healthcare spending dollars. 
so they don't have to go begging or asking the federal government for help every time there's a crisis. You do quote a physician in your book, Mike Curlew, I think is how he says his name, works in Sioux Lookout in Northern Ontario, and he says the system isn't broken, it is designed to do what it is doing. Mm -hmm. What did he mean by that? Well, he means that the Canadian healthcare system was never designed for First Nations people or their needs in mind, ever. I mean, you have all of these remote communities. None of them, very few of them, have access to doctors, have clinics with them that are staffed with nurses that are properly trained or even equipped with clean water and equipped with modern-day medicines that you need. I mean, it's quite remarkable that in some communities in this country, children die of preventable illnesses like strep throat. Hmm. Strep throat. I write about a a boy, a four-year-old boy named Brody Mikas, who died because when he went to the clinic, he was the nursing clinic in his home of Sandy Lake. He was sent back to uh, to his home with his parents Um, and told to use Vicks Vapor Rub on his chest. You know, any other clinic in Ontario, if you're near an urban centre, you would get a strep test. Mm -hmm. Or perhaps a doctor would have picked up on the fact that, oh, this child has strep throat and needs to be treated. And this can be treated with antibiotics. But what happened to Brody is he passed away. Here's an excerpt from the book as we follow up on this issue. From 1986... Through December 2017, there were more than 558 suicides across Nishnabiaski Nation territory, a community comprising only 49,000 people. Last year, 2017, was the worst in recent memory with 37 suicides. Most of the suicides are by hanging and the majority are by young men. The number of attempts, those who try to take their lives but fail, is even greater. Since 1986, an almost incomprehensible 88 children between the ages of 10 and 14 have killed themselves. Tanya, to what extent has suicide now become almost normalized in these communities? Mm. It has in certain communities. Suicide surrounds you. Suicide happens to the people that you love, the people that you know. Imagine you're a child growing up in that environment. That is something that is like sickness, it's something like an accident, it's suicide. Oh, right, that happens too. Suicide almost becomes normal. It becomes part of your everyday existence. It becomes part of your vocabulary. Does it become less shocking as a result? Absolutely. It does. Absolutely. But to the people that are experiencing it, Mm -hmm. the shock is still there. The trauma of that death is unbelievable. But does everybody else get inured to it in some respects? I think that when children are growing up in that, they're seeing it and they're feeling it and it just becomes another way for them and it becomes something that can happen. It's a way out. I I know that there are, there will be people watching this right now who, when the issue of colonialism and its impacts continuing to be Mm -hmm. felt today, will roll their eyes and they'll say, oh my goodness, I mean, come on, we're hundreds of years, you know, removed from that. Uh, But it's a factor still, isn't it? Of course it is, and we're actually not hundreds of years removed from that. We still have something in place in this country called the Indian Act, a piece of legislation that was created in 1876 that governs the life of every single status Indian in this country. Status Indians did not get the right to vote until 1960. The last residential school shut in 1996. Mm. There was another level, another tier of health care in this country, Indian hospitals. They were all over this country. Colonialism, the effects of colonialism, the trauma of colonialism, children being taken away by the foster care, by the uh, children's aid system, that is still happening and being put in foster care in record numbers. Look at the justice system. So many Indigenous peoples are put in jail. They're not participants in the justice system. They're not sitting on juries. More are graduating from law school, but more need to be graduating from law school. They need to be represented by clerks as well. They need to be represented by security guards. I mean, we have, we are seeing the effects of trauma in this country because the trauma was never dealt with. So we cannot dismiss this. No, absolutely not. You know, it is still happening. And what is happening too is there's always these piecemeal little solutions, right? Okay, well, we'll give you some funding for this and maybe that'll make it better. Oh, we're going to clean this up. This will make it better. But that's... It's not working, is it? I mean, 150 years of Canada, 151 years, Mm. we're still here in this place trying to figure out 
How do we make things equal? You do write a lot about death in your book, obviously, because that is a huge part of the story, but not just the death of people. The mass killing of dogs belonging to Inuit. Talk to us about that. It's quite a remarkable thing that happened from 1950s to the 1970s. It's a mass killing of sled dogs. Commit. They are husky dogs. Um, Inuit, this is how they survive with their dogs. They have since time immemorial. You know, it's a remarkable thing. The dogs, um, they, they're always part of the family. The dogs know everything about, you know, where to step, where to hunt, how to keep their owners safe. And as part of the relocation process, because the Canadian government wanted to remove Inuit from the land and put them into urban centers mm -hmm. as part of a security measure too, you know, with the dew line and everything going up north and in regards to sovereignty. So they moved Inuit into city centers. Well, this was completely against Inuit, their way of life. In order to do that, the dogs were killed. By whom? By the RCMP. The dogs were rounded up and they were killed. The dogs were seen in an urban center as a, um, as a security risk, mm -hmm. as a problem too, you know, because they could attack somebody. But it was a fundamental misunderstanding of how important the dogs are to Inuit people. I mean, it's, it's quite remarkable. So in, a, I think it was 2005 that um, the Canadian government uh, standing committee heard about what happened to the dogs. Thousands of dogs were killed. And so they said, well, let's, we, need, we need an inquiry. We need something to, to happen here. The federal government did not sanction that. But what they did do was they said to the RCMP, we need an investigation into what happened to the dogs. So the RCMP investigated themselves regarding the dogs. They came out with a 26-page report, which basically exonerated themselves, saying, you know what, that really wasn't the case as to what happened here. Um, but the Inuit said, hold on. The Kikatani Association, which represents Baffin Island, said, you know what, this report? No, I don't think so. By you denying what happened, you are basically denying the voice of all of our elders who remember what happened with the relocation off of the land and into city centers and the dying, the killing of the dogs. You've just dismissed all of their collective experience and what they saw. It's subjugation. Hmm. So they did their own report and found their own findings and said, you know what, this was all part of assimilation. Inuit were also sent to residential schools. Hmm. Inuit children taken away and they are also put into foster care as well. Inuit are not under the Indian Act, but they have still suffered the same effects of colonization. Well, in which case, in our remaining moments, can we look at some other examples from perhaps other countries or elsewhere around the world uh, who deal with similar issues and maybe they have found a way that we have mm -hmm. not yet found? Mm -hmm. what, what can you help us with on that? Well, I went to northern Norway, to the Arctic Circle, to visit the Sami. The Sami have been following um, the reindeer for thousands and thousands of years. They're indigenous people to um, northern Norway, to Russia, to Sweden, to Finland. And um, the Sami also have experienced, just like what's happened here in Canada, they've experienced a separation from the land, a violent separation from the land, being you know, forced off of their area. The Sami have been put into residential schools. They've lost their language and their culture. Their children have been adopted out. It's actually the same thing that's happened here. It's happened over there. They've experienced the same when it comes to the suicide crisis as well. They have many, many youth that are dying. In order to stop it, Sami people decided they had their own funding, luckily. They had their own funding. They were in control of that. They devised their own plan on how they could take children and their parents and treat them all together. So it's the donut of care. There's a circle around them. And that is something that I think that is a model that we should be looking at here in Canada because you cannot just treat children that have been traumatized without treating their parents as well or their caregivers that are also experiencing levels of trauma. So the Sami take the children and with their parents and for one month they put them in townhouses. And these townhouses, the children live with their families. They live, um, they go to school. There's a school on the premises. 
And they also live a traditional way of life. They have traditional foods. When the kids are at school, the parents are treated by psychologists, by doctors, by um, mental health workers that are all traditional SAMI practicing. And when the children come home, everybody also receives care. So it's a really holistic method. And they also go out on the land, the family and the caregivers. They all go on land for three days. They experience what we call land-based therapy. So returning back to culture, returning you know, to fishing, to hunting, just to being on the land. And this program so far has worked wonders. And I think that is a model that is something that we should be looking at. I wonder whether it's applicable, though, in a place as vast as Canada. I mean, mm -hmm. Norway is a fraction of the size of Canada, mm -hmm. and the, the distances one has to travel, the remoteness, uh, is not really comparable. Could mm -hmm. it work here, given the vast dif distances here? Well, it would be up to the First Nations communities and Inuit communities mm -hmm. to decide if it would work here. But I would argue that it is time to give these communities, First Nations communities, control of their own funding so they can make their own decisions and make those decisions for themselves. Because right now we have a system where we have to send children who are in mental health crisis by themselves out of a community into urban centers. We put them up in hotels or we put them up in group homes and wait for them to get care by a psychiatrist to get assessed, by mental health workers, by psychologists. Mm. That's not working. And then what we do is we send them right back to the homes that they came from that sometimes are struggling and also need care. Mm. That's not working. You know, mm. perhaps a rethink is needed here. Uh, I guess we got time left. Let's do a couple of other examples here. Um, indigenous people fighting back. Sterling Lake, the quiet riot. What was that story? It's a story from 1987. That's when the quiet riot happened. And Sterling Lake is a residential school, was a residential school that was run by the Mennonite Church. And why I really, when I first heard this story, I was just, I was amazed because what is so important about this story is this is a story about resistance. This is a story, and I have not heard very many stories about students within a residential school rising up and saying, you know what, it's not okay. Where is it? It is, um, Sterling Lake is in Northwest Ontario near the Manitoba border. Okay. And what happened there was, um, I was speaking to this one uh, man, he's a man now in particular, he was 17 years old when, and his name is Rance, and he was, um, he was beaten because what the adults would do, the teachers, they would take children to make an example of them or to punish them. They would take them downstairs. And this is what they did to Rance. They took him downstairs. A man held each of his arms, each of his legs, and he was beaten with a wooden stick on his behind. And he was beaten so badly, he could barely walk. He couldn't sit down. It was excruciating. That didn't just happen to him. It happened to many of the kids that he knew in that school. And not just that, too. They were punished. They received demerit points um, for things that if they were acted out or if they just did something that was against the rules. They weren't allowed to listen to any rock music. <clears throat> this is in 1987. They had to listen to church hymns constantly. Mm -hmm. If anyone was seen breaking any of the rules, they had to do things like go outside in minus 40 weather and cut down logs or saw logs you know, without gloves or the proper winter wear. I mean, this, it, was pretty, it was pretty awful what the kids had Torture. to endure. Absolutely, it was torture. But the kids got together and said, you know what, we're, we're not going to take this anymore. And so they decided, that's it. You know what, the next time this happens, somebody come and tell me, and we're going to, we're going to take up our own arms. And that's what happened. One night when they took another boy, all the other boys decided that's it, the older boys. They grabbed sticks and they fought. They fought the teachers. And they managed to scare them off. They went into another area of the residential school. And for that one night, the kids of Sterling Lake were there and they were survivors and they were resistors. Mm -hmm. They were in control finally, and they weren't being tortured anymore. Of course, that lasted until the next day when the police came and then all of the kids were arrested. And it was for many of them, it was their very first time in court they were treated as young offenders, and they lost their year in school. Many of them, they all went to different places. 
but the effect of what happened during that time stayed with some of those kids, of course. The trauma of what happened during the school stayed with those kids. But as Rance said, this was one of the very first times that they had come together and the spirit of what was happening south of the border years ago with the American Indian movement, this was an act of resistance because they knew they were fighting against colonization, against what was happening to them. And as I say in the book, they know the fight is not over. I, I, I want to finish on this because the, I, I, I don't know how you keep your own mental health telling you all, all these stories. You've lived this now for so many years, first with Seven Fallen Feathers and now with this. I mean, this, is, this is a lot to deal with. How do you cope with all this? I'm lucky to have such a strong community and strong group of friends that I really do lean on. Um, my elder, Sam Ashney Paneskum, I speak to him almost every single day. Um, and he is separated from me because he's often, uh, if he's not in Thunder Bay, he's in some far-flung part of the province mm -hmm. helping someone else. And he's always on, uh, believe it or not, Facebook, and we're always messaging each other. And he always sends me, hey, how are you doing? Or he'll send me a funny little gif of, you know, smiling and waving cats. Um, <laughs> Reaching out like that, speaking every day helps. Speaking to uh, the people that I write about, the families that I write about, keeping in contact with them. You know, it's not just, for me, this is not just writing books or, or telling stories. You become part of this too, right? I mean, I'm very involved with the students from Dennis Franklin Cromartie High School in Thunder Bay. I'm very involved with a lot of the families from the Seven Fallen Feathers. And it's, it helps, we all keep in contact. It's like a weave. Continuum. Good. Keep going. Mm -hmm. Miigwech. Miigwech to you. All our relations, finding the path forward, and uh, I guess all the lectures are online as well if you want to watch the lectures. Uh, they are. They can be viewed yep. as well. Tanya Talega, thanks so much for coming into TVO tonight. Thanks for having me. And that's it for tonight's agenda in the summer. Tomorrow, a conversation from four years ago with four Indigenous women on how they practice leadership in their communities. I'm Nam Kiwanuka. Thanks for watching TVO and for joining us online at tvo.org. And we'll see you again tomorrow. The Agenda in the Summer with Nam Kiwanuka is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism. The agenda is always on. To catch up on conversations from this week or any week, visit our website, tvo.org slash the agenda, or our YouTube page at youtube.com slash the agenda. It's all there for whenever you want to watch. The Agenda in the Summer with Nam Kiwanuka is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism.